What's up everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'm gonna talk about Go's context type. Now, I have the context package documentation open and it tells me that the context type is a type that carries deadlines, cancellation signals, and other request scope values across API boundaries and between processes. What does that even mean? It means that the context type is used for primarily two things, cancellation and holding data, right? So holding those request scope values. Now, cancellation of what? Well, cancellation of the functions that you're calling throughout your program. So if, you're, if your function takes a context and it calls another function that takes a context, well, you can check that context to see if it's canceled and that'll let you know that whoever called you has canceled this context, you should please exit as soon as reasonably possible. Or you can store some values in the context and the functions that you're calling that all take that context can check those values and pull them out of the context to see if they can use them for anything. I'll show you both of them in this video. But first, let's look at what a context actually is. Well, the context type is just an interface, which means that any concrete type that has these four methods, deadline, done, error, and value, any con concrete type that has those four methods can be a context, right? It implements the context interface so it can be used as a context. Now, generally we don't implement our own custom context type unless we're doing something like really elaborate, but we just use the one that the standard library has. Well, where can you get that? You can get that context by calling either one of these two functions here, background or to do. Generally the pattern is to call background in your main program and then use other functions that are that are exported here to create child contexts that either have cancellation associated with it or have values stored inside. So you the general pattern is call background and then call these other functions that you see here to get child contexts. If you want a child context that has cancellation associated with it, you would call one of these with functions up top here. So you have with cancel, you have with cancel, with deadline, with timeout and they all give you a new child context that has the ability to be canceled or expired. The with cancel gives you a context that has a cancel function that you can call that, that immediately will cancel the, the context. With deadline gives you a context that has a, a cancel function as well, but also expires at this given timestamp. With timeout gives you a context that also has a cancel function that you can call if you want, or it also expires after a given duration of time, right? Say like from five seconds from now or so. Any one of these with functions will give you a new child context that has cancellation. This with value function down here, this one gives you a new child context with values stored inside. And that's generally the, the, the two kind of APIs you're gonna use when you are working with context. You're gonna call background to get like a parent context, and then you're gonna call one of these with functions to get a context that has some sort of cancellation associated with it, and then you might call like with value to like store values inside of the context. We'll see all of that as we look at the code. So let's go over there. So going to the code real quick, we have this beautiful main function and I probably should have used a uh, Vim. Yep. We have this beautiful main function here that has a package level logger that I'm just going to use to log some stuff. You can kind of ignore that, but it has this run jobs V1 API that we're calling looking at the run jobs V1 API. It just takes a number of jobs, iterates over them, logs that we're starting a job, does some like simulates some real work by sleeping from one millisecond to 500 milliseconds, and then logs that we're done with that work. So what does that look like? Well, if I run it, you'll see that it you know starts job zero, finish jobs zero, start one, finish job one. So you'll see that it runs these jobs one at a time. And if I do this a couple of times, you'll see that it does what it's supposed to do here, right? So everything here seems really nice. It just runs the jobs and you'll see that the, the jobs like vary in the time that it takes anywhere from one to 500 milliseconds. Cool. But what is the problem here? Well, I wanted to do this and show you that like, this is an example of a real world function that you might run into. Someone wrote a function and it does not take a context, but you're going to have you're going to end up calling a function inside of your function that does take a context. And now what do you do? Well, you call context to do, that's what you do, right? Cause you can see that this info context function that I'm calling inside of my function, it takes a context as its first argument. 
I don't have a context to give it because I wasn't given one myself. So I, I do the best thing I could do and call context out to do to signal my intention that, hey, I need to update this function to take a context. So because I need to pass it down to this logger.info context that wants one. This is how you signal to like yourself or other engineers, I need to refactor this code. And what would such a refactor look like? Well, it would basically just be adding a new um, parameter here. That's a context. And then updating the cause to be using that context. Like so, and that would be a refactored run jobs v1 API. However, if I did that, and I went back to main, my compiler is going to say, Hey, you need to update your function call here and pass it a context. And that's technically a breaking API change. And now you're gonna have to refactor your code. What does that refactored code actually look like? Well, I have some stuff for you here. And you'll see it looks something like this. So this is the run jobs v2 API. And you'll notice that it's the refactored version of my run jobs v1 that takes a context. And now in order for me to get a context to pass to the run jobs v2 API, I need to call context.background to get that background context. And then from there, I want to actually add some cancellation to my context because I know that running the jobs can take anywhere from one millisecond to 500 milliseconds per job. And I'm running three of those jobs, but I don't want to wait any more than 250 milliseconds for those jobs to run all three of them. Right? So I'm going to create myself a new context with a timeout of 250 milliseconds. And that means after 250 milliseconds has passed that this context that I'm creating is going to expire. And my run jobs v2 API is going to know that it's, that it's going to see that it expires and it's going to cancel. And we'll see that the cancel function that I'm getting back is something that I can use to cancel the context immediately without waiting for this, you know, timeout to occur. And that's useful if you've like, if you do some work and you decide like, oh, I've ran into an issue before this 250 milliseconds is over. I ran into an issue that prevents me from proceeding. You can call the cancel function yourself and immediately cancel the context. And that's just what that's there for. I'm not actually going to use the cancel function. So I'm just going to defer its call to like after main exits, but that's what it's there for. Let's look at run jobs V2. So this looks very similar to run jobs V1 with the exception of this block right here, right? It, it, it has the context being passed. We've updated the calls to like info context down here to use that new pass context. But what we're doing is we're checking now each iteration of our jobs that we're running. We're going to like briefly check whether or not the context has expired, right? So the context that we've been given, we need to check if it's expired because if we don't, we're not respecting the context that's passed, right? We're, 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 a, we're going to be a misbehaving function if we don't come up for every now and then and check if the context is expired. We do that by using the select pattern here. Select is a way to like select values off of go channels. I'm not going to go into details of channels in this video, but just know that when a context expires, it'll have a value on a channel ready to send you right, ready to signal to you that, Hey, there's things done. So the way you do this is you do select, you try to pull a value off the channel. If you can't, then you default to this default case down here and you keep going through the code. So what this code is saying is, Hey, is the context expired? If it is log an error and return. Otherwise, if it's not fall through and keep doing the job that you're doing. So you'll see like the first iteration, check if context expired, it's not do the job. Second iteration, check if context expired. If it's not, do the job and so on and so forth. This is what I like to call respecting the context. Let's see how this works. So I'm going to now run this code and you'll see that after it ran, it ran the first job. It also ran the second job, but notice how these two jobs took more than 250 milliseconds combined. So it wasn't able to run the third job because the context has expired. We checked that it was expired and we got out of there. Now I've built some like, you know, variation in this, right? It can, each job can run from one millisecond to 500 milliseconds. So if we get three jobs that happen to run before 250 milliseconds are, are up, they'll all run. So if I ran this, like, you know, n number of times, I might get anywhere between 
one job passing to like all three jobs passing, right? If I just kept running this over and over and over and over again, I'll get like that variation because I built the code that way. But we can see that the con the context is being respected and it's being like, it's returning us once the context has expired. Let's make this misbehave a little bit, right? So let's say, let's not respect the context. Let's move this, this logic actually like down after the for loop. So after we run all the jobs, then let's check if the context expired, right? So if we do this and we run, let me clear the screen for you. You'll see that it runs all the jobs, <laughs> no problem. Look, even if the jobs take more than 250 milliseconds, like in total, it still runs all the jobs and then it checks that the context is expired. This is a misbehaving function that should be refactored because now we are not respecting this context correctly and we're not returning as early as we otherwise could. So the point I'm trying to make here is be mindful of where, like when your functions take a context, be mindful of where that context is um, being checked for expiration and try to do it at a point in your program where it's safe for you to return if the context has expired, but do it often enough that you are respecting the context if you're doing a long, like a lot of work, right? Cool. So let's move on to, to not just context cancellation, but let's also move on to like values within context. So I have another one for you. There we go. So this time, let me add some imports. This time, not only am I going to maintain that like 250 millisecond context cancellation that I was doing, but I'm also going to add a value into my context. And I'm going to store some metadata inside my context that my run jobs v3 API can like pull out if it needs to. And the metadata that I'm going to put in there is a trace ID because I want every every job that I run, I want its logs to have a trace ID associated with it, right? This is kind of normal pattern that you'll see in programs. Um, if you use like popular tracing libraries, you'll see that it adds a trace ID through the context, right? Because you can do like new span from context or whatever it may be. This is a little like simulation that I want to show you that kind of shows how that works. Now, we use this with value and you'll notice that we have to give it a parent context, a key to store the value at, and then the actual value itself. And you'll notice that both the key and the value are any types, so they can be like any type in Go. But if you read the docs, and I know I know you read the docs, well, I hope you read the docs, you, you, better, you better read the docs if you're watching this YouTube channel. Um, this context key shouldn't be any built-in type so that it can avoid collisions, but instead you should use the concrete type, the empty struct. And I'll show you like that we're doing that. So let's go into run jobs v3. First thing you'll notice here is we have a new type that represents our context key. And since we read the docs, we're using a type that is the empty struct. Then we're creating a new type to actually hold our data, right? So a metadata structure that has a trace ID associated with it. This is the type that we're gonna put inside as the value. So we have like key and value essentially. And then in the run jobs v3 API, we have a few changes here. Actually not much, like not, not many changes here at all. Everything from the, this for loop down is the same as v2, literally. Like if you look at this code, look, it's exactly the same as v2. We iterate through the jobs, we respect the context, we log the start, do the work, log the stop. That looks great. The new stuff we have is up here. Well, the first thing I'll really cover is we shadow this global logger so we don't mutate it. Generally speaking, I wouldn't do this in like production code. I'm just doing it here because I have a package level logger and I'm going to overwrite it potentially with a new logger that has the trace ID inside of it. And I don't want to mutate the package level logger. I want to mutate my own copy of it. So I, I kind of shadow it here, right? In a real production code, I'd probably associate this with like a a field on a struct and put, put this in like, in like some state somewhere, but I didn't want to overcomplicate the example. So I just, I'm going to shadow it here, but the real beef of the work here is this. I'm going to now use the value method on the context to pull out a value that's associated with this key. So if I read this left to right, I say, Hey, context, give me a value 
that's at this key and then type assert it against this metadata type. And if all of this is true, right, if all of this is okay, if I was able to get a value out of the context from this key and the type of that value is a metadata type, then enter this loop here or enter this, this conditional here and create me a new logger with the trace ID that was retrieved from the context. Like this is, this is kind of beautiful code. And it's not because like I wrote the code, but because this pattern is so pretty, right? Like I can reach into the context, check if something's there. If it is there, use it. If it's not there, just go about my day. So now I'm, I'm using this context to get that request scoped value, which is a trace ID for here. Let's see what that looks like. So if I run this code, you'll see that all of the log lines now, if I run it a few times, you'll see that all the log lines have a trace ID associated with it. And this is coming right out of the context. So every time I call run jobs V3, the it'll generate me a contact, it'll generate me a trace ID, put it in the context. And then now my run jobs V3 code can pull that trace ID out of the context and log it. So nice. And let's take a look at the code again. If I actually removed this context right here, right? If I don't put anything inside of the context, no values, that's perfectly fine. My code still runs. It just doesn't log the trace ID anymore, right? Because now we're, we're not only just respecting the context for its cancellation purposes, we're trying to see if there's values inside the context or not so we can use them. And that's like a perfect, perfect place to put those like request IDs, those trace IDs, user IDs, any other piece of data that needs to live for the duration of like your context um, request path, right? Like as we call functions down the call stack. Very, very, very beautiful code. And that's about all I really wanted to show you. I think that this is super powerful and I want everyone to understand like what you're using context for and you see it everywhere. So I want to recap real quick. So context is for two things, right? It's for cancellation and it's for, you know, storing values, really request scope values, but this is the two things that context is used for. And the way you kind of use a context is you call context background to get that parent background context. And then from there in your code, you're going to create child contexts with the cancellation that you want or with some values inside of it or both, right? You're gonna, you're gonna pass that all around your program and now you have a way to control cancellation and put value, putting values everywhere. Generally speaking, by convention, if a function takes a context, it's going to be the first positional um, parameter for that function. That's just a go convention. You'll see that in pretty much everything that you, that you use that has context. So if you're going to create functions that take context, make sure you put it in its first position as well. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I really, really hope you enjoyed this video. I wanted to kind of demystify this for you, and I hope that that has happened for you. And if you have any questions, please leave comments. Please ask. I'm I'm here to help you all, right? I'm not here to make money off of all this stuff or sell you a course or this and that. I just want to help good people become good engineers, right? Like that. That's that's the whole gig here. So please, if you enjoy it, let me know. If you don't enjoy it, also let me know, right? I don't care. I can take criticism. Um, but I do this to help you all. And thank you. See you in the next one.